Welcome back to Forensic Bites. Today I wanted to talk about aerosolized fentanyl, a non-lethal chemical weapon, wherein non-lethal is in inverted commas, but also its classification as a chemical weapon. So before I launch into the topic, I wanted to recap what we covered in a previous video, wherein we discussed that fentanyl isn't predisposed to be absorbed through the skin, it takes several hours to do that, and also that the regularly encountered powdered form of fentanyl isn't predisposed to become aerosolized, meaning that it's very hard to get it airborne and it will settle out relatively quickly. And this makes inhalation a relatively unlikely route of administration. But you might be wondering if anyone has ever sought to overcome those challenges in order to weaponize fentanyl. And as it turns out, yes, that's been attempted. So in considering fentanyl as the basis for a chemical weapon, Chemical weapons are typically gases or liquids with a low vapour pressure, meaning that they can evaporate to completely fill a space and be breathed in. The fentanyl family of drugs are neither of these things. They're solids, which would mean they'd need to be modified in order to become airborne. To aerosolize a powder, it needs to be made incredibly fine, in the order of tens to hundreds of nanometers. And for reference, a human hair is about 60,000 nanometers across. Looking at the diagram to the right, we can see the scale of tens to hundreds of nanometers in this sort of area relative to a grain of pollen for scale. Now, you will all be familiar with aerosolized powder of that scale because it's what you see when you look at a fire burning with white smoke. The smoke is a solid, it's comprised of soot and ash, and it's suspended in the air, and it will not settle out. And the reason is that the solids in smoke are so fine and light that air currents will push them around to fill any space. Designing a drug to replicate the effects of smoke requires fairly advanced research facilities because you'll need to purify the drug, modify it to make it that small, as well as analyse it to make sure that you haven't degraded the drug as well. So this is not something that anyone could typically do. This is the job of researchers or scientists. So having worked out the properties of your chemical weapon, you're probably going to need to choose what sort of drug you're going to employ. And there are many modified versions of fentanyl that can deliver either stronger or even weaker effects. For a chemical weapon, you're going to want the most potent version that you can make, but it also needs to be stable enough for handling, transport, and delivery. This leads us to two variants on fentanyl called carfentanyl and remifentanyl both of which are more potent than regular fentanyl in different ways. So looking at the diagram, you can see the average lethal dose for three different types of drug, heroin, fentanyl, and carfentanyl. And looking at the amounts, you can see that carfentanyl is around about 100 times more potent than fentanyl itself, and I believe about 100,000 times more potent than morphine. Remifentanyl is a little bit different. It's actually less potent than fentanyl, but the reason why it's attractive for use in a chemical weapon is that it takes effect much more quickly. This leads us to our case study, the Moscow Theatre hostage crisis of 2002. In that event, the Dubrovna Theatre was seized by Chechen terrorists, taking around 850 hostages inside. The terrorists had a single demand, which was that Russia withdraw troops from a war it was fighting in Chechnya at the time. Giving in to that demand wasn't acceptable to the Russians, so a raid on the theatre was planned to liberate the hostages. The layout of the theatre was daunting for the FSB. It involved traversing a 30 metre corridor and then going up a defended staircase to access the main theatre area. They'd be faced by 40 to 50 terrorists and they'd be armed with Kalashnikovs, pistols, grenades and improvised explosives. They'd also demonstrated over multiple days that they were willing to die fighting as well as kill hostages. So how did the FSB proceed? They decided on the use of aerosolized fentanyl, which they would deliver through the air conditioning vents. The main theatre was climate controlled with ducted AC piped in via vents throughout the ceiling. The raid began with the release of aerosolized fentanyl into the AC system and witnesses in the theatre reported that it looked like smoke coming from a fire. And this is indicative of a solid aerosol being used and not a gas or a vapour suppressant. Wherever the fentanyl came into contact with people, they quickly lost consciousness. And this coincided with the beginning of the FSB raid on the theatre with special forces wearing gas masks. Now, in preparation, some of the terrorists had also brought their own gas masks, 
and this triggered a 60 to 90 minute gun battle. At the conclusion, 125 to 200 hostages had been killed by the chemical agent, so excluding any deaths caused from the fighting. So how do we know that aerosolized fentanyl was used? Shockingly, the Russians weren't particularly forthcoming in what they'd done during the raid. If only Russians had been involved, perhaps we wouldn't have such a good idea as to what actually happened, but there are about 50 international people present in the audience, and while they were initially treated in Russian hospitals, they were very quickly expatriated and treated in their home countries. And this information comes from two British casualties who were transported back to the United Kingdom. Their hospital records showed inhibition of tendon, pupil, and corneal reflexes. And this is consistent with the effect of opioids, where the pupils constrict and become non-responsive to light. There was also records of respiratory depression and cyanosis. And from opioid overdose, we know that one of the ways that it kills is it slows down breathing to the point that it stops. This leads to a low blood oxygen level, which gives a bluish appearance for which the technical term is cyanosis. Toxicological analyses were performed on clothing and urine of the British survivors, and this was done in Porton Down, which is the United Kingdom's government laboratories for testing CBRN, so chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear threats. After performing chemical extraction on the clothing, the test came back as positive for carfentanil and remifentanil. And I'm just showing the response for the carfentanil on the right. And you can see at the top, the unknown extract gives a strong response at a retention time of 2.06, the instrument then runs a blank to make sure that there's no background interference before running the next sample. And bottom one is a standard, a known chemical sample of carfentanil, which shows the exact same retention time. Analyses would have been conducted in this way, the unknown first, followed by a blank to show no contamination, followed by the known sample, just to eliminate the possibility that the known sample contaminated the unknown sample. The analyses from the urine only showed fentanyl metabolites, but this isn't that unusual, since drugs taken up in the body are routinely broken down before being excreted. So it's quite rare to see the initial drugs in a urine sample. So to conclude, the siege provided a unique insight into Russia's development of fentanyl-based non-lethal chemical weapons. And there's debate still today as to whether or not to class the operation as a success. The outcomes that were seen were typical of Russian doctrine, wherein the need for total secrecy outweighs the interest to public safety. One of the reasons that the casualty rate was so high is that no warning was provided to medical personnel about what was going to take place during the raid. In the hospitals, the doctors were prepared to deal with bullets, burns and explosives injuries, whereas instead they were confronted by people suffering from opioid overdose. Even initially, the first responders could have been given naloxone or an opioid inhibitor, which would have probably improved the outcomes for the hostages. Now, the world at large took note of this, and nine days later, a US National Research Council issued a report entitled Developing Effective Non-Lethal Weapon Options is Needed to Enhance Naval Force Capabilities, showing that there was recognition that these capabilities could be useful, as well as the need to defend against these types of capabilities. And just to end, it also triggered congressional interest in classifying fentanyl as a weapon of mass destruction under the Chemical Weapons Convention, as recently as March of 2022. Although to my knowledge, this hasn't been done yet. That's all I have for today. Thanks for listening.